Provost, uh, Professor John Dewar, Deans of the Law School and the Faculty of Arts, Professors Cromlin and Considine, Sir, Gus Sir Gus and Lady Nossel, uh, the immediate past Chancellor of the University, Dr Ian Renard, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, and in particular, our distinguished speaker, uh, Shri Kiran Miran, uh, Martin. My name is Alex Chernov, I'm Chancellor of the, this University. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this uh, 2010 Chancellor's Human Rights Lecture. I'm delighted to see that so many have braved the weather and uh, I came along this evening reflecting, I think, community's interest in human rights. I begin in our customary way by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations who are the traditional owners of the land on which this ceremony, uh, event will take place and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. By way of background, the Chancellor's Human Rights Lecture was instituted by the then Chancellor, Dr. Faye Miles, in 2002, and has become an important annual forum for public debate and discussions around critical issues of human rights, and its importance to the community can't be overstated. Speakers included Mary Robinson, the then President of Ireland, Exane Gusamo, the then uh, Prime Minister of East Timor, the Honourable Michael Kirby, the Justice of the High Court of Australia, and the former Prime Minister of Australia, the Right Honourable uh, Malcolm Fraser, to uh, mention a few. This annual public lecture fits within the university strategy that is based on three intertwined core activities, namely teaching and learning, research and engagement with the community. And this lecture is a very much an important and in integral part of our engagement activity through which the university interacts with and contributes to the knowledge to the community and importantly, it learns from it. Thus, the university is proud to show leadership in events such as this lecture. It sees public engagement and debate as one of the most important reasons for its existence. In keeping with that spirit of communication, after the lecture, there will be time for questions and discussions and at the conclusion of the lecture, Associate Professor Peter Deutschmann, Associate Director of the Nossel Institute, will deal with questions directed to Dr. Martin, and after that, move the vote of thanks. But before introducing the guest lecturer for this evening, I would like to highlight briefly the close connection between human rights and poverty. The concept of human rights encompasses the recognition that every person in the world, irrespective of citizenship, race or class has certain basic rights which others should respect. Such rights are essentially moral rights. As Amatea Sen has noted in his work, The Idea of Justice, the appeal to human rights operates in a wide range of circumstances. It is not limited to situations such as arbitrary incarceration or racial discrimination and so on. Sen's ideal of freedom includes the notion of capacities, that it is not enough to have merely legal rights. People must also be given the capacity to make choices. Thus, it includes the demand for end to hunger and starvation and medical neglect across the globe. And relevantly for this evening, it includes a demand for an end to poverty, including an end to inhumane treatment of those in that terrible predicament whom the Minister for Human uh, Resources in India, Sri Kapil Sibyl, described in his inaugural Australia India Institute lecture earlier this year as those who are not seen or heard. And it is in this context that we assemble here this evening to hear our speaker, uh, Padma Sri Kiran Martin, founder of the director and director of the ASHA Community Health and Development. Uh, society. Dr. Martin, Martin gained her Bachelor of Medicine and Bachelor of Surgery degree from the University of Delhi's, Delhi's Maluna Azad Medical College and she then specialised in paediatrics at the Lady Harding Medical College within the same university. Inspired by her Christian faith, Dr. Martin's work to help the poor and marginalised in New Delhi slums began in earnest in 1988 when she responded to a call from a slum landlord to deal with the cholera, cholera outbreak there. She had no facilities to do this, 
Nevertheless, she set up a borrowed table under a tree and began to work saving lives. And this she did, and as Dr Martin learned more and more about the hardships and deprivation faced by the people there, she started to devise ways of addressing these problems. And after some time, and with the growing cooperation of a grateful, grateful community and the Indian government, she enlisted like-minded helpers and founded the Ashes Society. Now, more than 20 years later, Dr. Martin is an influential figure in the field of slum development. Ashes programs are benefiting more than 400,000 people in and around 50 slums in New Delhi. As you will hear, Dr. Martin's early model of urban health has developed to meet the changing needs of slum communities and consistently achieves extraordinary results. The slum housing model that Dr. Martin developed in the 1990s has been widely praised and includes innovative work in women's empowerment and primary and secondary education. Further successes included a financial inclusion scheme devised in partnership with the Ministry of Finance in India and more recently, groundbreaking work to improve slum children's access to higher education. She has knocked on many ministers' doors in pursuit of assistance to slum dwellers, and her persistence and good sense have paid off for their benefit. In 2002, Dr Martin's achievements were recognised by the Indian government when she was awarded by the President of India, the Padma Shri, one of India's highest Civ uh, civilian awards, akin, I believe, to knighthood in England. Dr Martin's work is supported by formal and registered Friends of Asher Society in Great Britain, Ireland and the United States, in addition funding agencies such as Tear Fund New Zealand, Tear Netherland and ICCO Netherlands support that work, alongside with international government agencies that include AusAid. Numerous overseas visitors have visited ASHA, including the then Dep Deputy Prime Minister, the Honourable Julie Gillard, the Governor General of New Zealand, the First Lady of Japan and many Cabinet Ministers from a range of countries. In addition to appearances before the United States House of Representatives and the British House of Commons, Dr Martin has lectured at Harvard University, MIT and Cambridge University and has, and has spoken at numerous international conferences as well as giving talks at hospitals, churches and Friends of ASHA events in various locations around the globe. And the work of ASHA has been cited in publications, research and case studies by institutions such as the World Bank, Tear Fund and others. Highly relevant for tonight is that the Nossal Institute of Global Health, centred at this university, hosts a university-wide engagement with the ASHA project that includes a critical evaluation of the ASHA model. We may hear a little more of this important work later. And ASHA is also on the brink of teaming up with the Australia India Institute, which is also centred at this university. We are indeed fortunate to have Dr Martin speak to us this evening. The size of the audience attests to this interest in the subject as do the numerous apologies received for this evening's lecture, including that from the Prime Minister, who, as you've heard, has visited the slums uh, in her capacity as Deputy Prime Minister. In that capacity, she also launched in September 2009 the Australia India Institute in New Delhi. The Prime Minister has expressed her regret in not being able to attend, but has asked that her best wishes be passed on this evening. A like apology has been received from our Vice-Chancellor, Professor Glenn Davis, who has another prior commitment which has prevented him from attending this evening. He also sends his best wishes, and there are many other apologies of like nature. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I would now ask you to join me in welcoming Dr Kieran Martin. The Honourable Alex Chernov, Chancellor of the University of Melbourne, Sir Gustav Nossel, Lady Nossel, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. 
It gives me great pleasure to have the opportunity to address you all this evening. I am delighted to be back in your lovely city that I enjoyed thoroughly during my first visit to Australia this April. I would like to begin by transporting you to what I saw when I first entered a slum colony in New Delhi in August of 1988. Shanty huts made of cardboard, plastic sheets, and pieces of cloth, barely 50 square feet in size, lay tightly packed together. Piles of rotting garbage were everywhere. Pigs wallowed in ponds filled with dirty water and solid waste. Little children played around the filth and excrement that lay all over. Some were rummaging among garbage, looking for bits of metal and plastic to sell. Most were severely malnourished and ill. The public toilets at one end of the slum were piled high with rotten feces. The urinals were broken, and the stench of urine and excreta filled the air. There were small, shallow hand pumps everywhere that the residents had dug themselves. The water was brown and contaminated with feces, and everyone used it for drinking, bathing, and washing. Electricity was being tapped illegally from overhead cables, and hundreds of live wires that had been hooked onto these cables found their way into people's homes. A closer look at the shanty hut revealed that there was barely enough room for a small cot. There were no windows or doors. Pots and pans were hanging under the roof to collect the leaking rainwater. A little kerosene stove and a few utensils lay in a corner. Huge rats kept running across the floor, and there were flies and mosquitoes everywhere. The women looked pale and tired of life. There seemed to be large numbers of men lying around, doing nothing. Some lay on the ground, drunk and reeking of alcohol. 5,000 people lived sandwiched between a large, dirty drain on one side and a government office complex on the other. Growing up in a middle-class family in Delhi, I had been accustomed to seeing slum colonies all over the city, but only from a distance. I had no idea of what went on within. The disconnect that I felt at the time was largely because I was influenced by the general disdain and apathy towards slum dwellers that was prevalent among the middle class and the wealthy. Right from my early days in medical school, I was drawn to the plight of poor patients that I encountered in the public hospitals on a daily basis. I learned that the majority of them came from the city's slums. As time went on, I began to feel within me a growing passion to want to make a difference in their lives. Added to the initial horror of what I saw when I first walked into Ambedkar slum was the realization that the slum was in the grip of a cholera epidemic that was raging through the city's shanty colonies. I knew I had to act quickly, so with a borrowed table and chair, I sat in an open space and began to treat hundreds of sick children. Ambedkar slum represents over 30% of the total population of 14 million in India's capital city, New Delhi. The UN estimates that the number of people in the world living in slums passed 1 billion in 2007. Sub-Saharan Africa has the highest annual slum growth rate at 4.5%, followed by Southern Asia at 2.9%. 20% of the world's slum dwellers reside in India. The residents are deprived of their rights in nearly every conceivable way, suffering from numerous health, environmental, social, and political problems. The maternal mortality ratio at 750 
and under five mortality rate at 149 are among the highest in the world. As relentless rise in food prices in urban areas combines with persistently low incomes, the urban poor cannot afford to purchase adequate amounts and types of food. Even if there is enough food for the whole population, only the rich can access it, while the poorest struggle every day to ensure two meals. Serious malnutrition and stunted development is widespread in slums. Children from poor families are often born into hunger, grow up in hunger, and might die in hunger. Community conflicts occur regularly as different languages, religions, and castes offer little sense of cohesion. Women are mostly restricted to the roles of domestic servants or child bearers and struggle to voice their opinions. The sex ratio is about 850 girls to 1,000 boys, and female feticide and infanticide are common. To give you an example, Mayapuri slum is located along a railway line with trains passing by every few minutes, sometimes just a couple of feet away from slum huts. In October of 2006, an Asha Health volunteer found a newborn baby girl on the tracks minutes after the train had gone by. She had been pushed down the toilet hole of the fast moving train. The majority of people living in slum areas work in the urban informal sector, which is characterized by job insecurity, low wages, and dangerous work. The markets for land, basic services, and labor are skewed in favor of private interests. These unequal opportunities create minorities in the marketplace, whose individual members are automatically excluded from a wide range of outcomes associated with economic growth and globalization. Slum areas remain a blind spot when it comes to policy interventions, job creation, and youth support. The urban advantage of better access to education remains a myth. For most slum families, educating their children is the last thing on their minds. As families struggle to survive, many children are forced to work to supplement the family income. Every child up to the age of 18, uh, 14 sorry, is entitled to free schooling, but the government schools they attend are poorly resourced and have low teaching standards. English and computing skills are barely taught, and the option of higher education remains an expensive dream. There are no democratically elected institutions in slums. Residents are therefore exploited by unscrupulous politicians and self-styled slum lords who take advantage of their large numbers and lack of education. Slums are termed as vote banks. Election is not a free expression of the will of the electors who are coerced into casting their votes in favor of political parties to whom slum lords owe their allegiance. Gross human rights violations in the form of forced evictions and sudden demolitions are common, although they are in complete violation of Delhi's slum housing policy. Slum inhabitants do not have a legal document, such as a title deed, to prove tenure rights. From my early beginnings in 1988, I went on to establish the charity Asha, that is the Hindi word for hope. 22 years on, Asha works among 400,000 slum inhabitants, focusing on a holistic, multi-sectoral approach that addresses the health, environmental, gender, educational, political, and financial rights of the urban poor. I recognized right at the start that empowering slum communities to become partners in slum development would be the key to help them realize their rights and attain sustainable poverty reduction. Participation is critical to enable people to achieve their full capabilities, demand better services, and foster equality. It forms the heart 
of a rights-based approach to human progress. My initial efforts at establishing partnerships, however, proved very difficult. The poor had a dependency mindset that was well entrenched through the empty promises made by political leaders. There was a general feeling of distrust towards outsiders as well as towards each other and a fatalistic approach to life. I began the painstaking process of helping slum women get organized. The breakthrough came when they started to experience success through their collective action. They then became excited about the possibility of change. Today, Asha has facilitated the organization of large numbers of community women's associations that work in partnership with Asha. Thousands of slum women have become lead agents of transformation in their communities. Another key element in Asha's strategy is to build healthy collaborative partnerships with all stakeholders involved, such as political representatives, central and state government officials, educational authorities, the police, and so on. This gives the poor the power to participate in the administration of government. We began with rights-based healthcare programs and environmental improvement and focused on these areas for some years. ASHA health centers were established in all the colonies. Hundreds of community health volunteers and birth attendants were trained. The women's associations were successfully able to advocate for their environmental rights. They were able to gain access to safe water and sanitation, paved roads, and electricity. In the 90s, Asha engaged in path-breaking work with the city's government to provide land titles to slum women. This came to be known as Ekta Vihar, the capital's first on-site slum housing program. Owning assets greatly enhances a woman's ability to influence decision-making at the household as well as community level. Women were given land titles and bank loans and became proud owners of their own homes. Planned colonies were built with proper infrastructure. A remarkable transformation in living conditions began to happen. The program was, however, fraught with challenges. There was major opposition to providing women with ownership titles in a feudal and patriarchal society. Huge kickbacks were involved in land transactions. Well-off neighbors did not want slum dwellers living next to them. Slum lords who had grabbed large areas of land within the slum refused to vacate. The bureaucratic red tape seemed impossible to negotiate at times. Exploitative political forces opposed the program and issued me many personal warnings and threats. This pilot initiative paved the way for the slum housing policy at both the state and the national level. The government subsequently granted land tenure to thousands of slum residents all over the city who were now able to realize their rights to safe and healthy shelter. Despite the success of this initiative, land security has been consistently challenging. What you see here is an unexpected forced eviction that took place in Delhi in 2006 as part of the urban renewal process in preparation for the Commonwealth Games. The government had planned to illegally demolish the homes of over one million slum residents without rehabilitating them. What happened was that at midnight on 24th April 2006, Policemen from the local police station announced to the residents of this colony that they would have to vacate their slum by 6 a.m. the next day. Over 15,000 men, women, and children who had been living there for the past 25 years were in a state of shock, as were we. Five bulldozers arrived the next day, approaching the slum from all sides. The huge wheels of the giant machines crushed the bricks, the plastic, the utensils, the cots, mattresses, pillows, chairs, tables, everything. The residents lay down on the ground in front of the bulldozers. Hundreds climbed all over them. 
but to no avail. Now the government official in charge of the operation was busy barking orders and uttering profanities when all of a sudden a huge live electric pole that had come loose fell on him and he died on the spot. He had sustained a massive head injury. The police temporarily halted all operations and went away with his dead body. Meanwhile, we saw our chance and we were able to gain the attention of Mrs. Sonia Gandhi through hectic lobbying with a number of members of parliament. And she instructed the city's authorities to rehabilitate the residents with Asha's help. Every family was given land titles at another location called Savda. Savda is now a well-established neighborhood where thousands of residents who would have become homeless because of the Commonwealth Games now have a home of their own and lead a life of dignity. In January of 2008, the then Finance Minister of India, Mr. P. Chidambaram, who is now India's Home Minister, accepted my invitation to visit an Asha area. He was deeply moved by the diversity and extent of the transformation that he witnessed. However, when he found out that barely anyone had bank accounts, he realized that his government's policy of financial inclusion found no expression among urban poor communities that made up over 30% of the population of every town and city in the country. The very next day, he invited me to a meeting with the branch managers of the national banks in the area. He facilitated a relationship between ASHA, the nine largest public sector banks of India, and with the Ministry of Finance and requested us to design a loan scheme for the urban poor. The next few months were exciting as bankers, finance ministry officials, and ASHA team members worked together to make this happen. Mr. Chidambaram, whom you see here in this picture, formally launched the project in June of 2008. Thousands of zero balance accounts were opened with banks competing with each other to open the most accounts. Since the launch, millions of rupees have been given by the banks as low interest loans for businesses, home renovation, transportation, and so on. The residents are able to access the entire range of banking services. The loan repayment rate, with trust as the only collateral, is an astonishing 99%. And many families have significantly enhanced their incomes and taken second or third loans. When banks opened their doors to the urban poor of our nation for the first time, I began to realize that the right to higher education for slum children was no longer a distant dream. It could become a reality as banks were willing to come forward with higher education loans. Higher education is viewed by slum families as a process that delays their children's ability to contribute to the family income. Most families have no money to spare for college tuition and other expenses. Children struggle with the lack of space, the noise of the slum environment, and unreliable power supplies. They have no role models, and nobody takes the time to talk to them about their career options. They therefore end up doing the same unskilled and poorly paid jobs as their parents. Asha's higher education program is a pioneering effort. For the first time in its history, in July 2009, India witnessed the acceptance of 106 slum children to one of the nation's most renowned centers of higher learning, Delhi University. <coughs> India's Home Minister, Mr. P. Chidambaram, was the chief guest at ASHA's university acceptance ceremony on August 8, 2009. It was a proud day for the slum children and their families, for Asha, and for our nation. Students from Asha slums all over the city were admitted to bachelor's degree honors courses in the sciences, commerce, and humanities, 
and job-oriented degrees such as nursing, hotel management, travel and tourism, and so on. Hundreds of well-wishers from India and abroad filled the auditorium to congratulate them as they went up on stage to receive scholarships from the Home Minister. Their parents were filled with pride as they began to realize the enormity of what had happened. The students warmly welcomed India's cabinet minister for education, Mr. Kapil Sibal, during his visit to Asha. He was delighted to hear of their stories and wholeheartedly congratulated them for becoming trailblazers in this path-breaking initiative. We also had the immense privilege of hosting the Honorable Miss Julia Gillard at Asha in September of 2009. The newly admitted children were eager to describe to her their experiences. She was excited to hear of their remarkable journey and paid tribute to them for their achievements. This year, the number of children is much higher, and two of our students found places in top engineering colleges with acceptance rates of just 0.1 and 0.5%. They will be the first two engineers from India's slums. ASHA focuses on providing individual support and counseling to students during their final years of high school and guiding them through the entire college admission process. We then award them financial aid towards college tuition and other expenses and facilitate access to bank loans. Guidance and support to the students continues throughout their college years. The opportunities for enhanced learning have been seized with great enthusiasm. Children who would have once been working in roadside stalls, shining shoes, or picking rags, now have the confidence to attend university with much more privileged youngsters. The process of their integration into the rest of society has begun. After spending years longing for equality, they are finally experiencing it. So what does an established ASHA slum look like today? ASHA health professionals provide quality care to every one of its residents. Community health volunteers and midwives chosen by the community and trained by ASHA administer simple but highly effective means of primary health care. The child mortality rate has fallen from 149 to 28. The average for India as a whole is 69. Maternal deaths are extremely rare. 95% of children under five have received all their vaccinations. And vaccine preventable diseases are hardly ever seen. Most couples have two or three children and women are realizing their reproductive rights. The majority of people, including children, are healthy. And an entire generation has become more aware of how to access their health rights. There is improved access to safe water, improved sanitation facilities, drainage systems and paved streets, and safe and healthy shelter through land tenure reform and capital investment in infrastructure. Almost every child goes to school and is therefore being protected from economic exploitation and hazardous work, harmful to the child's physical, mental, and social development. Many are attending university and enjoying equal opportunities for a higher education. Each person has their own financial identity and access to the entire range of banking services. The resulting economic activity has brought about higher living standards. Women have been empowered to take control of their own lives. They actively pursue the best interests of their families and their communities. An environment has been created for them to enjoy political freedom. They seek to influence and participate in the public affairs of the society to which they belong. They enjoy more respect and cooperation from men who also play an exceedingly important role in community development with positive and supportive relationships being established between the two sexes. Children's associations function democratically. 
demonstrating an understanding of their rights as well as their responsibilities. Slum lords have gone out of business and strong, effective relationships with political leaders and relevant officials are in place. Political participation is therefore meaningful and well informed. Vibrant and harmonious communities are being built where people seek to live responsible lives in a spirit of understanding and tolerance. A few words about challenges. Some that we faced were related to the callous and apathetic attitude of government officials, the high levels of corruption, and complex government procedures. Opposition from powerful and influential politicians with vested interests, and the exploitative environment created by slum lords was sometimes overwhelming. Through our experiences, we learnt that healthy relationships with all stakeholders were important. Oppressive social structures must be challenged through nonviolence and active peacemaking. Treating everyone with respect, being strategic and diplomatic, courageous and persevering was at the core of our approach. Talent, skill and professionalism were important but equally important were authenticity, solidity, character, and personal substance. The ASHA model is an example of how cities can be places of inclusion and participation rather than places of exclusion and marginalization. In all developing regions, improving the lives of slum dwellers calls for programs that include housing infrastructure and finance, improved water and sanitation, and adequate living spaces. These programs must be associated with schemes including microcredit, self-help, education, and employment. Slum upgrading is strongly linked to health and nutrition programs and should be a part of a comprehensive approach to improve lives for the urban poor. <coughs> Eradicating hunger will require multiple interventions, and not only those related to food availability. The fight against childhood diseases must look beyond the traditional realm of the household to encompass the modern environment of disease, the city as a whole, with all its attendant risks and harms. A healthy, well-educated population is a major asset for any city. And knowledge is a prerequisite for enhanced civic particip participation in the social, political, and cultural spheres. The education of girls and young women generates powerful poverty-reducing synergies and yields enormous intergenerational gains. It is positively correlated with enhanced economic productivity, more robust labor markets, higher earnings, and improved societal health and well-being. If the social, political, economic, and cultural dimensions of the inclusive city are to be turned from a mere conceptual paradigm into reality, they must be implemented within a rights-based framework. Slum dwellers must benefit fully from the urban advantage, must participate equally in decision making, and enjoy effective fundamental rights and liberties with full exercise of their citizenship. Improving the lives of slum dwellers is the best way to achieve all the Millennium Development Goals. Improved housing conditions and provision of water and sanitation will not only save lives among the very poor, but also support progress in education and health. A city cannot claim to be harmonious if large numbers of people cannot meet their basic needs while others live in opulence. 
Cities are, on the contrary, vehicles for social change, places where new values, beliefs, and ideas can forge a different growth paradigm that promotes rights and opportunities for all members of society. An inclusive city produces social stability and economic benefits and promotes positive outcomes for each and every individual. Governments must therefore back commitments with bold policy reforms and prevent future slum growth with equitable planning and economic policies. If they continue with business as usual, it is estimated that an additional 400 million people will be drawn into the misery of slum life as the global slum population reaches 1.4 billion in 2020. I congratulate the Honorable Mr. Chernov for his commitment to promoting the discourse and practice of human rights both within the university and in society as a whole. I pay tribute to the university for opening the path toward developing the interests of the many students who begin their professional studies with a keen awareness of the international human rights movement. The university's approach in fostering the study and teaching of human rights is a lens through which students and scholars can observe and evaluate the world's events. I also congratulate the university for its leadership in furthering human rights within the Australian community and in the international sphere. I look forward to us working together to achieve the objectives of poverty eradication and sustainable development among the urban poor of India. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Peter Deutschman. I'm from the Nossel Institute for Global Health, the institute at the University of Melbourne that hosts its relationship uh, with uh, ASHA. And uh, I'd like to give Kieran just one or two minutes respite before we invite her to take your questions and comments and uh, to introduce the relationship uh, that we're um, forming. Kieran has invited us and we're very privileged to ex extend into a partnership which will assist ASHA to better uh, document and understand it, the model of the last 22 years, the ASHA model. We anticipate that um, we'll be able to develop a compelling argument and statement such that ASHA can take it uh, to the government of India in such a way that the other 90% of Delhi's uh, slum population and the many other cities of India will benefit through the adoption of the ASHA model. It's also a partnership that which we anticipate will extend uh, and meet in increasing numbers the aspirations of young people who are resident in the slum communities uh, with whom ASHA works. We've heard already of, of their aspirations and we've, we've been thrilled to hear tonight of the opportunities of access to higher education in New Delhi on merit alone but with the great assistance of ASHA. And we want to be part of that partnership. And we've discovered this week that the wider university seeks to be part of that partnership, and indeed the wider community of Melbourne, such as the interest and level of support. I'd like to invite Dr. Martin to return and take your questions and comments. Uh, your questions and comments will be recorded, as has been the lecture. So I'd ask you to state your name, uh, indicate your question clearly, and if you have a comment, to present it uh, briefly. Kieran. There are two microphones to assist you, one on either aisle.
Um, hi, my name's Leilani Elliott, and I'd like to first of all congratulate you on your immense achievements and those of your organisation. Um, I'm a strong advocate of a human rights based approach and I'm also a little bit sceptical of it because um, it's a paradigm that although very well meaning has also been conceptualised and introduced by very well meaning but privileged people. So I'm wondering to what extent um, your programs are driven by the needs and the interests as identified by the slum dwellers themselves. In fact, the entire ASHA approach is a need-based approach, uh, which is the very reason why I uh, went in as a pediatrician, but uh, immediately realized that the slum dwellers articulated needs related to civic services, which is why environmental rights were addressed at the very start. And we went on to improve safe water and sanitation uh, in the work. Uh, housing was another area that we did not intend to address as a team of health professionals. But it was such an important and urgent need that was articulated by the urban poor because of their fear of the demolition that was always hanging over their heads that we felt it was important to address that. And so the story of Asha and the various milestones on Asha's journey have been a response to the needs as articulated by the urban poor themselves. The gentleman in the middle here. Hello, my name is Angus McClay. I represent a, a Christian human rights organisation. And you mentioned the importance of the framework of human rights in developing the community that you've done, the, the, the cohesiveness. We've just come out of a fairly rancorous debate in Australia last year about whether we would implement a, a human rights act at a federal level. And uh, the government decided not to. One of the arguments against that was that it would create division and, and a disharmony within the community. The individualism would, of rights would, uh, would do that. I wondered what your perspective was um, from, from India looking at the West in that issue, but also as a Christian how you deal with human rights and how you integrate that with your faith. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> It's uh, very important uh, to understand the, Ash the approach of ASHA towards the realization of human rights in communities uh, so widespread uh, in the different parts of the city slums. The approach is a non-confrontational one. These slum development programs take years and we want to make as many friends as we can. We don't want to make enemies because there's uh, we are never going to be able to attain our goals if we did that. So the entire approach is based on non-confrontation. It's based on creating lots of goodwill, plenty of healthy relationships with all the stakeholders, rejecting a person's deeds in the context of relationship, but never rejecting the person, whether it's a police official or a corrupt government official or a slum lord or whoever it might be. It's important to have an inclusive approach. Every stakeholder must feel involved, must feel that it is a, a responsibility that they have to bring slum development from their domain. And this inclusive approach, which reaches out to people from all castes, all religions, all socioeconomic backgrounds, makes it possible to realize these rights. If you look at our women's groups, they're represented uh, across the range. There are Hindus, there are Muslims, Christians in a small minority, uh, higher caste, lower caste, the very poor, the not so very poor. So they're all represented and a democratic institution is very important to create at the grassroots and the institution must be inclusive in its approach. Uh, thank you, Doctor. My name is Matt Dixon. I'm from Department of Health here in Victoria. 
Recently, I saw a Channel 4 documentary um, by a fellow called Kevin McLeod, who's famous for uh, a show called Grand Designs. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the show where he went into a slum in Mumbai and spent a couple of weeks living there. It's been a bit controversial and it's been criticised as, um, as poverty pornography by some people. But my question is, one of the uh, suggestions that he made from that experience was that perhaps in developed countries we might have a hell of a lot to learn from people in slums because of their ability to live in social harmony and live happily. I'd like to have your response to that notion. Well, if you enter a slum, uh, you don't really find much harmony uh, when you walk in. <laughs> There's a lot of rivalry. There are so many different slum lords there representing different political parties. The reason why development is impossible is because there's so much factionism in the slum. There's, there's rivalry, there's uh, divisions based on caste. You might have a certain part of a slum where people from the higher caste live, another part where people from the lowest caste, in fact, they're untouchables. They refuse to use the same water pump, they refuse to talk to each other. So all of these divisions are very prevalent. There's so many social bar barriers, religious barriers in the slum. And to work, to build a harmonious community, is something that takes a long time and a lot of commitment. But it's possible, as has happened in the case of Asha, where these barriers can be broken down. Ultimately, they're all migrants from rural areas. They come to the city in search of work. And they want a place to live, and they come and they start living in a slum. And therefore, any kind of social harmony that anyone observes as an outsider, uh, you know, just for a, having visited for a short while, is really a mirage. Uh, my name is Judith Morrison. Uh, Dr. Martin, uh, do you see any benefits from the com uh, current Commonwealth Games uh, for the sl uh, slum dwellers in Delhi? Well, uh, I, would, uh, I told you the story of what happened in 2006. And of course, because of the uh, strong advocacy work carried out by Asha, not only the slum that uh, we were located in managed to get land titles, but a whole lot of others. And of course, it's fair to say that if those slum dwellers were still living where they were today, uh, they would have had huge problems in the monsoons, the areas would have got flooded. Of course, now they live in the safety and security of their homes. But overall, if you go today to Delhi, where the games are on, you'll find huge billboards hiding all the slums. <laughs> They're completely out of sight. You can't see them unless someone told you that they were behind these billboards. They're really massive. And so the government had plans to rehabilitate uh, lots of, uh, lots of uh, slum colonies into multi-story blocks and try and get the city rid of slums as much as possible. But unfortunately, that did not happen. Hello, my name's Andrew, and I'm also very impressed by what you've achieved and your, your humanity. Um, I, in caring for people that are... Uh, um, living in this world together as we need to. Um, when you mentioned uh, that they're made aware of their reproductive rights, um, did you mean by that that they're made aware of contraception, for example, um, especially in this day and age, realising that resources are becoming more limited, the population of the world is constantly increasing at a very great rate. Did you mean they're made aware of the fact of contraception, condom use and all that, uh, as we all need to be. Is that what you meant by reproductive rights? Partly. Uh, that is partly what I meant. But I also meant that uh, women have the right to choose how many children they would like, and they also have the right to space their families. Uh, in uh, Indian slums uh, that are uh, where you have uh, feudal and patriarchal societies, women usually do not have any reproductive rights. Uh, they have so many children, one after the other, much against their wishes. And because of lack of spacing, there are high maternal and infant mortality rates. But reproductive rights can only be realized in a broader framework. If there's safe water, there's sanitation, if there's good quality housing, if there's an improved healthcare uh, system in place, there are fewer children who die, and so people are more confident to limit their families. If the infant mortality and child mortality continues to be so high at 140, 000, uh, 149 for every 1,000 live births, 
it's going to be very hard for the government to implement family welfare uh, programs to limit the population size. We've got time for one more question, which we'll take from this gentleman at the side here. Please use the microphone, we'll record it. Roger Reardon, the Cybeck Foundation. My question is quite closely related to that. What's been your experience on the rate of population growth in these communities when you give them good health, good so on? Does it go up or does it go down? Mm -hmm. uh, with all of these different interventions that I described, the birth rate has fallen from 40 to 18. So it's remarkably gone down. Uh, Families don't have more than two or three children at best. Child survival has gone up greatly. Infant mortality and child mortality has fallen. And therefore, the average family size has gone down greatly. We had six to eight children per family. Now there's not more than three, most possibly two. And that's only been possible because of a multi-sectoral approach which is holistic in nature. Final question. Oh, thank you very much. My name is Corey Watts. Um, I work on agriculture and environmental policy. I'm, I'm interested, um, you made a comment about um, the fact that these communities were the product of rural to urban migration uh, for very complex reasons, but quite obviously looking for employment. Do you, does your organisation attend to the sources of those communities in the countryside? Presumably there are still connections with people in the countryside with those communities. So is there, is there an issue there and how do you attend to that? And if these people are, um, are farmers, is there any urban agriculture that goes on in those communities and how do you see that? The whole process of urbanization is something that uh, is global. And in fact, we all know that urbanization gives rise to wealthy cities. Unless there's robust rural development and unless there's robust rural infrastructure and robust opportunities for rural employment, migration to cities is going to continue. It cannot be stopped. The slum dwellers who come to Delhi uh, nowadays find it hard to find a place because the city is full and there's really not much place where a slum colony can come about. Asha's approach is a balanced one where we try to work in slums that have been established and that have been there for a very, very long time without any basic services or any rights whatsoever. And it's, of course, important to remember that they contribute very positively to the city's economy. All these beautiful buildings that, and all the lovely stadia that you see on television that, uh, uh, on the, uh, uh, during the games have all been constructed by uh, these slum dwellers. And therefore, they must have their space in the city. It's important for equitable policies to be realized by the government uh, when it comes to them. And like I said, they must not remain a blind spot. It's my very great privilege on behalf of the university and indeed on behalf of us all to move a vote of thanks to Padma Shri Dr. Kieran Martin. Dr. Martin. <laughs> Dr. Martin has introduced us tonight and given us a glimpse, a slice of her remarkable life. But more importantly, she's introduced us to many of the community in which she and her colleagues work in New Delhi. The remarkable introduction uh, demonstrates human dignity, resilience, and aspiration, aspiration now being realized by many of the young in achieving their ambitions for higher education. We've heard of the city of New Delhi as increasingly hospitable. Many of us have been there and found it otherwise as a visitor. But those who live there and those who live there who are very poor often find it, as Dr. Martin uh, introduced, a very hostile and uh, formidable setting. But we now find, as Dr. Martin has told us, a city that's inclusive, 
no longer exclusive. A city that's, as it were, being rebuilt. A city that's more hospitable, even to those among it that are very poor. And that's largely the product of the work of Asha, Dr. Martin, and people like her, her colleagues. We're privileged to be working with Dr. Martin. And I mentioned earlier uh, something of what that uh, work, how that work might be shaped. But there is a motive, an ulterior motive, um, which I'm proud to acknowledge. That that ulterior motive is that in working together, we, as a university community, might learn. For tonight, Dr. Martin has told us that a constitution, as exists in India, a legal framework, as exists in India, that respects human rights and respects the rights of citizens, it is uh, of itself insufficient, for there are many barriers to access uh, for those rights. And tonight, Dr. Martin has introduced to us the Asha model, as it were, the ways in which communities are assisted to overcome those barriers and to access those rights. And of course, we who live in a privileged country like Australia acknowledge, sadly, that we live under a constitution, that we live within a legal framework that protects our rights, but many of our citizens have difficulty in accessing those rights, in full expression of those rights, such are the barriers. We're hopeful that by working with Dr. Martin and her colleagues, our insights will grow and we'll have a greater understanding of how we who live and work in Australia might work and live uh, to the benefit of those among us who are less advantaged, so that we might grow a more inclusive uh, city, a more inclusive country. Thank you, Dr. Martin.